Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I have you with me, the presidential candidate of the African Action Congress, Omoye Leshore, and we're talking about his plans for Nigeria. Um, I was going through some of the things, a few of your interviews in the past, and you had, um, and of course, your plans. Yes. And there's a lot of promises <laughs> that you've made. And a few of them caught my attention. You said something about the minimum wage, yes. increasing it to 100,000 naira, investing $3.6 billion in infrastructure. Housing you want to do a mortgage dollar. plan up to 2 million naira for Nigerians. Workers, yeah. Workers. And uh, where is this money coming from, first of all? $3.6 billion. Yes. Where is this money coming from? Uh, it's coming from the Nigerian economy. What has been happening for a long time is that we've been spending billions servicing greedy, pe greedy people. And I'll give you an example. The banking sector in four years gave 5.3 trillion naira, about 5.3 to 5.7 trillion naira to businessmen, only 150 of them, only about 350 of them. They ended up as bad loans, and then they created Amcon to clean up the mess. Imagine if that had been, you know, invested in the housing sector infrastructure. You know, we are not talking about the five billion dollars we lose to corruption every year, right? But in case that is a problem, I mean, that's difficult to understand. Think about what we could do with our taxes. We are the lowest. We have the lowest tax rates uh, in West Africa, even on the African continent. We're doing that seventy. I mean, seven percent. So how, how are you going to change that? You, are, you change that by being the leader of the country by how? implementing, no, you know, you, collecting, collection of taxes is not, we're not increasing taxes. We're just saying that if you're an employer and you deduct taxes of your workers, you must remit it to the federal government and that would take us directly to eight to nine trillion naira. Let me explain how that happens. You see, you see with the Buhari regime, they said they collected five trillion naira in taxes. What is the budget of Nigeria? 8.8 .8 trillion. So if you did just a little bit more work, you can cover the entire budget with just taxes alone. You are not talking about oil and oil and it's because for me that's lazy economy. It's just there for you to collect. But the same people said they recovered money from EFCC. Jam is returning, you know, uh, profit for the first time. You have customs. All of these people combined together, if they are putting in their revenue as they should, we have more than enough. Let me, we talk about minimum wage. What is the minimum wage of Nigeria compared to our GDP? Our GDP is about $500 billion, yeah, dollars, and the minimum wage is about $1.5 billion. It's not even up to a percentage of our... Uh, and when you increase worker salaries or you pay what I call living wage, the investment goes into the country, you know. People invest in, you know, the local economy, they buy things. If you have a shoemaker who is buy, you buying shoe from or you're paying shoe from, now you go out there for two. Then he hires more people. Many, many how, people have always said that, you know, these promises are always easier to make it's when, not easier before to, you get in. I'm yeah, going somewhere. Yeah. And I like to ask a question a lot to people who are running for office yeah. because people have always said that one of our biggest issues with all of this yeah. is our civil service. And you can't change that the day you get into office by just increasing salaries and expecting things to flow. No, no, way. no. How do you fix the civil service in concordance so, with this? So this is interesting. You know, we have a civil service that's bloated. But it's not bloated because there are civil servants. It's bloated by corruption. The police, you know, found over 80,000 fake police officers. I think about two years ago. That was publicly reported. So if you use technology to weed out all the fake ghost workers from the system. You have a civil service that is real, organic. And what we're saying is that if you pay them their minimum wage, that is a living wage, they start working the way they should work. The ones that are older and not productive, you can buy them out of the civil service. What I mean buyout is that if you work, if you work for 25 years, I can give you a buyout opportunity to say, you know, instead of doing another five years, you know, we pay you off, you leave, you enjoy your retirement, and we hire new people, we train them, we professionalize them, and they become people who are familiar with modern civil service rules. I'm not saying that civil service is the only way you can hire people, but people often forget that most of even the private sector work that we need to be done in terms of regulation, in terms of 
what support even in private sector comes from the civil service. What about, just talk what, about, a, what about the states? How, how do the states play into this? Because, I mean, if you're going to increase the minimum wage, yes. the states have to be paying something as well. Of course. A lot of the state governments where, can't even pay where do you think, what we have now. How do you, do you fix that? Where do you think the states get the money to pay security votes? Is it not the same states that can't pay civil service? You know, so let me tell you, you have Kirby State. Kirby State made almost 100 billion naira from growing rice. They're selling rice even through Lagos. If you go to the federal government every month to collect the handout that it collects about 4 billion naira per month, if you're growing rice, if you're creative, you make 100 billion, which one would you rather do? Is to make the states productive, you know, and, you know, make them competitive. Because even laws in this country that are supposed to be implemented by the federal, they are, they are state laws. But people often forget that the states can grow and can participate in the growth of the economy. But when you start voting the same kind of characters into state as we have in the federal government now, what do you expect? You just have rent seekers collecting minimum, you know, they're collecting their own, uh, what they call security votes. There's never been a time in this country that states, you found a state governor who didn't pay his security votes. But they don't, pay minimum, uh, they don't pay salaries because they don't want to pay salaries, not because there's no money. So many of the states have drawn from Paris Club, they've drawn from a lot of reforms, you know, slush funds that Buhari gave to them. They still didn't pay salaries, not because the money wasn't there, but because they are interested in stealing the money that's meant for workers. And how it's do, up to the workers to hold them to, 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 to account. Yeah, I'm sorry to cut you in there. Yeah. How do you plan to work with, the, with the, these governors? And, because I don't know that, how many of, I don't know how many AAC members are running for governorship across the country. I don't know how many of them you expect to win these positions. How many, how do you expect to work with these parties that are most likely not going to be from your party if you win? Also with the National Assembly, because these are things that a lot of politics then has to come in, which is why sometimes work doesn't get done. Even in advanced democracies, yeah. we see that where there's a different party in, in, in government from people who they should be working with and nothing gets done. So how are you going to do all of these grand things? You, I mean, we've seen constitutional reforms. Mm -hmm. So we've seen all the bottlenecks we went through with that, with two parties that are basically have the spread that it should have. How do you plan to do all of this? So I'm not disappoint Nigeria. No, I'm not going to disappoint Nigerians. Nigerians are electing a president who is coming to change Nigeria, and Nigerians are standing by their president. The APC has shown to us, and that's the ruling party we have now, that even if you have all your members spread in majority in any of these, you know, houses, uh, legislative yeah, and national assembly. You is not going to guarantee you cooperation. But what we guarantee you cooperation is the aspiration of the people to have a different life, to have a different government, to have progress in their life, prosperity, and have peace. And I'm working with the people. I'm not going to be talking here about being held to ransom by members of the National Assembly, because if that argument were to be true and valid, then we might as well just, you know, uh, hand, you know, hand, and, uh, hand over to them and say, well, it's not possible to ever find no, a No, but it's a valid fact. It is Anywhere a valid fact. What I'm saying is that we're, something you can we're, look it's up to the people to also vote for these people, our members who are out there running for different positions. We have governors running in states. We have members of the uh, House of Representatives. We have senators running. We have House of... Do you uh, realistically see them winning? Absolutely. Why not? It's up to the, it's up to the people to vote for them. Why not? Why Nobody you... knew that APC members could win four years ago. They, they were set up by December of 2014. APC just had a presidential candidate. They won an election two months later. That's what Buhari, Buhari was produced in December why, 2014. Why, you talk about the APC now. Yes. We know how they came to be. There were yeah. coalitions made. Why haven't you tried that route? I mean, there's, I want to believe, 70 or 69 other parties yeah. besides the two main ones that yes. you could have had conversations with. Have you tried to have these conversations? We've, I've been to three meetings with young... Three out of 69? No. Not all the parties who presented presidential candidates are actually running. That you should know. And they are not pretending about it. You know, a lot of them just, you know, uh, they want to have it on their CV. There. So who have you had meetings with? You know, I've had meetings with Kisley Mogalu, I've had with uh, Faladro Toye, I've had with Kubese when he was running, I had with Obi, I had with... Uh, what Mundo came out of them? Well, we left the place unable to agree uh, on who should be a consensus candidate. Would you be willing to step down for it, any of it's them? It's not about stepping down. It's about finding somebody who can carry my aspirations to the presidency. If I find that person, we have the conversation. Stepping down is the last thing 
that should be discussed. So that was what, that was what you mentioned. That was what killed Pact. It was yeah. that they started discussing stepping down when they hadn't even found a candidate first. So you didn't find any of these qualities in any of these people. Oh, you look, well, you're talking about coalition now. You know, you are looking at coalition from a structural standpoint. You are not looking at it from a philosophical standpoint. That there's a coalition of Nigerians out there already who are coalescing under our party. And they are the same people that you find in coalitions that are structural. Even after you form a structural coalition, you still need the political parties to agree with the candidates. You still need members of you know, each of the candidates that are surrendering their mandate or whatever you want to still agree with them. But when you already have a coalition of people who are desirous of change, who are revolutionarily minded, you are only having partnerships at that point, and that's what our party is about. When we started, I was looking for a political party that could allow me to run as a president on their platform. It was difficult to find because they, had, they, are all, they all had their own agenda, which is different from what I wanted. And when we started our own party, we didn't have much difficulties in pushing forward, and within a short time, I mean the shortest time possible, our party became the most popular party in this country, new party. It was just about five months ago that AAC was uh, Why did you leave it too late, though? Do, do you think that's, that's a good way to go there's about running for There's for never office? a late time. There's ne it's never too late to aspire for freedom. You know, it's never too late. You know, people plan revolutions in days, and they happen. We didn't leave it too late. We started at a time we feel is the best time to strike. And you are seeing the results. Looking and people who have been around before us can't even compete with us. Looking realistically, and yes. I want you to be honestly, to yeah. be honest with me, you look at the APC and the PDP. Yes. You've had conversations across the country. You, you see um, your social media very active. You mm -hmm. see the kind of conversations that go on there. Do you honestly think you stand a chance? Absolutely. I honestly and absolutely know that I stand a chance. And we've seen it happen even with the debate they did yesterday. I was skimmed out of it, but since you mentioned social media, when the debate was done, I was trending on, on you know, uh, in the, in, on, you know, on Twitter. So you find somebody who didn't debate trending, that tells you something. So all these things count for something because people are connecting with the social messaging that we have out there about the different kind of politics that we're challenging the status quo and they have under, I've done debates with a lot of these candidates. And my message is different, and it was clear. It was laconic yeah. that this is what Shore wants to do. And this is, we're referring to some of them here about minimum yeah. wage, about security, about infrastructure, about how the country can change. What you need to challenge me on is if these things can be done. I've said it that it can be done, that we can have a minimum wage as a living wage that we can double our infrastructure, that we can invest 3.6 billion naira in housing, and that we can have a mortgage system in which an average worker can take 2 million naira in, in mortgage, and with 100,000, they can pay 20,000 every month and be able to pay back their mortgage, and actually build a house, and also use that as a collateral. You know, nobody could fault that. Not even the economists who are younger could fault this when we had to debate it on TV or one-on-one. -on -one. So we've discussed all of this, and come to the conclusion that, that we have a different, solid message that can take this country to a different level. And I'm not talking about next level now, because that's a fraud. And I say that with due respect to whomever designed that, but the highest level. But we can choose to remain where we are, be afraid, be complacent, and be complicit in some ways, you know, worsen our conditions, or decide that there is a way out, and a different way out, and we have clearly stated what the way out is, out of poverty in this country, out of the oppressive system, and the implicit destruction of our value system and our persons and our dignity. And the moment we decide that, we'll be free. The next day, you'll never hear about APC or PDP again because they have already shot themselves in the foot at any rate. They are just a facade. We went around this country. We couldn't find any structure anywhere where people really believed in it. If they did, they wouldn't need to buy votes. All right, we're going to take a break now, and uh, when we come back, we'll conclude our conversation. Please don't go. All right, welcome back. We're about to conclude our conversation here with Amoya Lechore, who's running for president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And um, what happens um, if you don't win? What are your plans? I cannot imagine that uh, we don't win this election, and uh, because we've done. So you're not uh, preparing at all for that outcome, isn't that? Well, it depends on what is victory for us. 
And the outcome, in my view, will be total win for all of us. Because no matter what we get at the end of this, there is a lot of things that people would have learned that cannot be unlearned. There are a lot of things that would have happened that can never be changed ever again. So this is more a learning curve for you? It's not a learning curve. Right? That's what I'm, you know, let's just, let's be very clear. I'm just saying that there are a lot of parameters that that's coming into play now. But the ultimate goal is to defeat the old order. And that is no way, this, that victory is non-negotiable. Is coalition, is the coalition still an open possibility for you? Well, we are open to people who want to join us. Do you think it's a good idea? I mean, as much as it's a multi-party democracy yeah. and Nigeria has, there's so many Nigerians, so we should have many parties, as many parties as yes. possible. But don't you think 72 is a lot? Like I'm, I'm saying, you know, I have met a few of them and I have not met more than maybe seven presidential candidates. I've met presidential candidates who greet me and say, Mr. President, I say, and they introduce themselves as, oh, I'm also running. And I say, which party? They say, don't worry. You know, because they don't, they're absolutely not. In I the, wonder, you know. I'd like to know who that is. Go on. <laughs> you know, like, not a few of them. So they, Have you met Mr. President? The president of Nigeria. Yes. I've never met him before. I turned down the opportunity to meet him in New York uh, in 20, I think, after he won, I came to the United Nations. Why did you turn down? I, uh, I just felt that uh, that was not what I'm about. You know, I didn't need to meet him to do what I need to do. I've never met a Nigerian president. You before. still don't plan on meeting him if, if he invites you? During the handing over, we'll meet. Yes, because he has to hand over to us. And at that time, we'll meet. Would you be willing to work with his government if, if he invited No, him? if I wanted to work with or government. Or any government. You no, know, if I wanted to work with government, I would have worked with several governments. You know, I've been around for 30 years. I'm not looking for a government position. I've always created my own jobs, you know, and careers. But you, you, have, you want to help Nigeria, right? I'm helping Nigeria in a lot of capacities. I've always done what I can to help this country and help myself. Because it will sound arrogant if you say you're helping Nigeria as if yeah. you're the only person. I'm helping myself. If Nigeria becomes a better country today, I'm doing it for myself, I'm doing it for my children, I'm doing it for my family. So nobody should be going around thinking that you have this messianic you know, mentality, you're helping Nigeria. What yeah. does that mean? You know, you're helping yourself. I want to live in this country in a safe, you know, sound, healthy society. I don't want to live in America anymore. You know? And I know a lot of people who are out there who are tired of living outside. Do you think that's a disadvantage? that I stayed in the U.S.? No, I, I think it's an exposure. And it made me just see the best of all worlds and probably the worst. You don't think you were out of touch at some point? No, not or at all. Or too comfortable? I was the one providing news to people who are here for 12 years. You have to be in touch to be a person breaking news for Nigerians when they are asleep. <laughs> On a final note now before we go, um, what has been the biggest surprise for you since you started running for president? Uh, it's to understand three basic things. Uh, one, that Nigeria is not complex, contrary to what they tell you. It's not complex. Not complex. Second is that Nigeria is not big, but it's just not integrated. You know, I travel around Nigeria. That's most of them we drove by road. The roads are bad, but it's a small place. Nigeria is almost the size of Alaska, and there are 50 states in the U.S. The last thing is that you actually don't need money to win elections in Nigeria if you reach out to people. And that Nigerians are actually not stupid. A lot of people think that, oh, you know, outside of Lagos and Abuja, nobody knows about politics. It's a lie. The people in the hinterland, they understand politics probably better than most people that are on Twitter. But they just haven't had a chance to relate with people who understand their aspirations. And we always talk over people instead of talking with them and talking to them. You know, that's what politicians are wired to do. So, and, and I find it very interesting that even though they said, you know, there is like division that we hate ourselves, nobody ever asked me about my religion in Jalingo or Yola <laughs> or Sokoto. You know, they, they do their thing, you do that, but we have been divided because it's the only way to conquer us, and they've done a good job at that. So, it's, it's amazing to, because this is the first time that I've traveled to that many places in Nigeria since I was born. So it's been an eye-opener. Seriously. Well, good luck with everything, and thanks a lot for being here today. Um, we'll be following your campaign and your run for office all the way through. Thanks Thank a lot for being here for today. Thank you for bringing me on your show. See you when I become president. <laughs> all right, we'll take a break now and be right back. Please don't go away. <laughs>